Good morning, Bristol residents. Thank you for joining me today for uh, today's presentation, The Ending, Book Versus Movie, When Film Adaptations Rewrite the End. My name is Dina Santarelli. I'm a professional writer. Um, I live here on Long Island. I've been a journalist for about 25 years, writing for many publications, uh, including Newsday, CNNMoney.com, Long Island Woman, First for Women. I'm also the executive editor of two military magazines, Family and Salute magazines. And I'm also a novelist, ghostwriter, and book collaborator. Here are some of the books that I've worked on in the last couple of years or written. Uh, the book on the top left is my debut novel, Baby Grand. And those two books in the top center are my two latest books that I worked on as a book collaborator. I Spy in particular will be um, published next week by St. Martin's Press and you can see Raising Men which will be published in the spring also by St. Martin's Press. It's a great pleasure to be with you here today. I actually spoke not too long ago at uh, the Bristol located in Comac and about my experiences as a writer and um, had a lovely time. Today's presentation um, is about two of my favorite things, books and movies. Uh, more specifically, books that get turned into movies. If you're like me, there's great excitement when you've read a book that you've really loved and discover that the book is going to be turned into a film. However, if you're also like me, there can be great disappointment when you see a film adaptation of a book and discover that so many elements that made that book great have been changed, particularly the ending. You may often wonder, why does this happen? Why didn't the film directors or screenwriters leave well enough alone? Does the author of the book know about the changes? Did the author have anything to do with it? Did he or she sign off on the change? Historically speaking, authors have had very little to do with the film adaptations of their books. In fact, Ernest Hemingway reportedly once said this about his involvement in having his novel adapted into a film. Drive to the border of California, throw your book over the fence. When they throw the money back over the fence, collect the money, and drive home. Nowadays, however, I've seen a trend of Hollywood starting to call upon best-selling novelists to work on the scripts for the film adaptations of their works. Emma Donoghue, the author of Room, recently wrote the script for the film version. Gillian, Fr Gillian Flynn, author of Gone Girl, wrote the screenplay for the film starring Ben Affleck. But, when, but even when the author is involved, there are usually differences between what is in the book and what is in the movie. Why is that? Well, there's actually lots of reasons. The first being there's simply not enough time to put all the details of a book into a film. A 300-page book would run about 300 minutes of film, about a minute a page, or five hours. Can you imagine being in the movie theater for five hours? <laughs> movie executives can barely get people out of their homes in there for two hours these days. Um, of course, today with more choices in filmmaking, such as premium cable and Netflix, there's a trend for film executives to opt to, rather than do a traditional movie release, do a mini-series uh, or a special event on HBO or Showtime, which gives them not only more time to tell their story, but lets people watch those stories from the comforts of their home. Even so, there would still be differences in what the book was and what the film adaptation is. Number two, it's because the medium is different. A film is an illustrated version of a book. It's visual and the artistic elements need to suit this type of medium in order to make it a more engaging experience. And because the visual aspect of a book takes place in our heads, what you see on the screen rarely measures up to how we've stylized the book for ourselves in our minds. Another reason movies often differ from the books on which they were based is that films generally have to attract a wider audience in order to be more profitable, to make more money. Therefore, dark, books or gritty books are often sanitized so that they can be marketed to more people. And the fourth reason why film adaptations are often different from the books in which they're based, books are the author's story. Films are the director's story. And sometimes the director, even if he is making a movie based on a book, is simply interested in telling a different story or aspect of that story. Let's talk a little bit about the various roles people have in making a film. First, there's the director. 
The, dir the director is really the author of a film. He or she controls the film's artistic and dramatic aspects. He or she vis visualizes the script and guides the technical crew and actors. Next is the producer, who is, generally speaking, someone who oversees the film from conception to completion, including marketing and distribution. They may have a hand in getting a script to a studio. They may help in raising money to get that film made. Um, executive producers basically oversee the producers. That's their role. A cinematographer or a director of photography runs the camera crews and works with the director to bring the story to life visually. The film editor helps take images, the film, that the cinematographer has shot and assembles those scenes into sequences that are pieced together to make a movie. And finally, there's the screenwriter who creates the story as a script. The screenwriter provides the blueprint that the director, the cinematographer, the film editor, and the actors all use to create a film. Now, how does a screenwriter differ from a novelist? Of course, both novelists and screenwriters create stories. Both are storytellers. Both create characters and develop plots, but they do so in different ways. The author uses words to write descriptions and plots to create a mood, while the screenwriter writes scenes and dialogue and stage directions to do or accomplish the same thing. Let's show an example using Emma Donoghue's Room. Remember, she wrote both a novel, Room, and the screenplay that it was based on. Let's look at the opening lines of the novel. Today I'm five. I was four last night going to sleep in wardrobe, but when I wake up in bed in the dark, I'm changed to five. Before that I was three, then two, then one, then zero. Was I minus numbers? Hmm? Ma does a big stretch. Up in heaven, was I minus one, minus two, minus three? Nah, the numbers didn't start till you zoomed down. What can we tell from this? Who's the narrator? It's a five-year-old boy. Who's he talking to? His ma. What does he see? Everything is there, written by the author. Now let's take a look at the screenplay, the first page of the screenplay for Room. Interior room, night, darkness, the faint background hum of a refrigerator. A light clicks on briefly, then snaps off again. Then on again, for a little longer. We wake groggily with Jack, five, blinking up at Ma, 26. She's standing in a worn t-shirt and underwear beside a lamp, switching it on and off at apparently random intervals. She cranes up at the recessed skylight, room's only window. It's similar, isn't it? Who's the narrator? Just like in the novel, we're told it was Jack. We, the viewer, wakes up with Jack. The scene's directions tell us what we're supposed to see. And it will be the director and the cinematographer and the actors who fill in the blanks for us. But for the novel, it is the reader who fills in all the blanks. Let's get back to our comparison of a novelist and a screenwriter. Both are storytellers, but they tell their stories in different ways. How else are they different? The author usually works alone. I can vouch for that, sitting at my computer in the middle of the night, alone, trying to type what I see in my head. However, the screenwriter, as we saw before, is only one member of a film production team. The screenwriter will sometimes work with the director, and sometimes, as Ernest Hemingway suggested, the screenwriter just hands off a script to a director and goes home. So when it comes down to it, the novelist really is the star of the show. But when it, when it comes to his own creative work. But the screenwriter plays second fiddle to the director, who has the primary creative vision. So because of time constraints, different audiences, different media, the director's involvement, film adaptations of books can be very, very different from the books on which they were based. And the endings, in particular, can be very different. Let's take a look at some examples. And let's start with. The Firm. I love reading thrillers, and this was the first John Grisham novel that I had ever read. Full of action, suspense, a great book. The story centers on a lawyer named Mitch McDear who signs on with a law firm that turns out to be a front for the mob. And when Mitch finds out and decides he doesn't want to work for the mob, he tries to take the firm down. 
He breaks the attorney-client privilege by copying company information and giving it to the FBI. Accepting that he will likely never be allowed to practice law again, he also swindles millions of dollars from the firm, along with another million from the FBI, for whom he had promised to cooperate further, and then escapes with Abby, his wife, and his brother Ray down to the Cayman Islands. Before fleeing, he leaves behind records, detailed records of the firm's illegal activities, as well as a recorded deposition that is enough to indict, indict half of the firm's lawyers. Now the film version of the firm, which came out in 1980, I'm sorry, 1993, tells a similar story, but has a very different ending. In the film, Mitch, rather than steal money from the firm, decides instead to expose a systematic overbilling scheme. Since he is exposing only illegal activity, he is able to retain his law license so that by the end of the movie, he is packing up his belongings in Memphis and moving with his wife Abby back to Boston, not the Cayman Islands, where he will presumably continue his career. Now, why the change? Reportedly, at this time, the producers of the firm were wary of adapting a best-selling book, fearful that readers of the book would trash the film if they were disappointed, which is what happened with the film adaptation of Bonfire of the Vanities, a film that by most accounts, if not all, was a total flop. According to Sidney Pollack, who directed the film, John Grisham's book was long and also a complicated story with a lot of characters. Quote, I thought it would be hard to find filmic equivalents for things that read very, very well. Plus, the novel was pretty dark. In the book, Abby, Mitch's wife, is raped and Mitch's brother is killed. Neither of those things happen in the film. Also, the filmmakers wanted to preserve Mitch McDear's personal integrity. They didn't want him to do anything illegal. Pollock and a collaborator began to rethink the story, beginning with the book's take all the money and run ending. Quote, I didn't want to do a film about a couple of yuppies who end up just as crooked as everybody else, Pollock told the magazine Entertainment Weekly at the time. Quote, I wanted to take the character of Mitch back to what he was at the beginning. Dirt poor, but at least he got his own life back. Even after filming had begun, Pollock still hadn't figured out how to get the movie to end the way he wanted it to. And it was reportedly a neighbor of Pollock's in the Pacific Palisades, screenwriter Robert Town, who had, wrote, who had written uh, Chinatown, who reportedly dropped by for a drink one afternoon, and they tried to figure it out. How could they maintain Mitch's ability to practice law and also satisfy the FBI and not betray his clients? Town consulted some attorney relatives of his who suggested the two white collar crimes that became essential to the film, overbilling and mail fraud. And by the way, overbilling was only one line, one mention in the novel. And the changes were made and the rest is movie history. Our next example is um, a film adaptation that changed the ending of a book that it was based on, and that's Jurassic Park. Jurassic Park was a best-selling novel written by Michael Crichton that was published in 1990. It's the story of how one man, John Hammond, was able to create a wildlife park of cloned dinosaurs by extracting their DNA from prehistoric mosquitoes, which had been preserved in amber. However, before the park opens, one of the park workers is killed by a velociraptor, one of the dinosaurs, and the park's investors demand that experts visit the park in order to certify that the amusement park is safe. So a lawyer, a mathematician, a paleontologist, and a paleobotanist arrive along with John Hammond's grandchildren to check it out, and of course, mayhem ensues. Frankly, it's probably one of the best thrillers I've ever read. Before Crichton's novel was even published, four studios reportedly put in bids for the film rights. Eventually, with the backing of Universal Studios, it was director Steven Spielberg who acquired the film rights for $1.5 million before the novel's publication in 1990. Crichton was hired for an additional $500,000 to adapt the novel for the screen. In 1993, the movie came out and became one of the most popular summer blockbusters of all time. And it did so with a different ending. 
At the end of the book, it was the Costa Rican military who came to the rescue by bombing the amusement park's location on an island called Isla Nublar. However, Steven Spielberg had different plans. Instead of a military intervention, Spielberg decided to have the T-Rex return to save the protagonists from the Velociraptor attack. Quote, I think the star of the movie is the T-Rex, Spielberg explained at the time. The audience will hate me if the T-Rex doesn't come back for one more heroic appearance. I don't know for sure whether Michael Crichton signed off on the revised ending because it was another screenwriter, David Kep, who wrote the final draft of the screenplay, which left out much of the novel's violence and made numerous changes to the characters. Okay, our third example of a film adaptation with a different ending is Planet of the Apes. We are all probably familiar with the screenshot from the 1968 film Planet of the Apes, the story of an astronaut crew who crash lands on a strange planet in the distant, in the distant future. Although the planet appears desolate at first, the surviving crew members stumble upon a society in which apes have evolved into creatures with human-like intelligence and speech. The apes have assumed the role of the dominant species, and humans have become a sort of mute subspecies of creatures. It's when Charlton Heston's character, George Taylor, stumbles upon the Statue of Liberty that he realizes that he is on Earth, the future Earth, after all, and he's not, not too happy, poor guy. What you may not know is that the screenplay for the film Planet of the Apes was written by Michael Wilson and Rod Serling, whom you may know from the Twilight Zone series, who based their script on a 1963 French novel of the same name. In the French novel, the main character is not astronaut Taylor, but a journalist. A journalist who lands on a different planet during the course of his travels, one that is inhabited by self-aware apes and tribes of dim-witted humans. When the journalist finally makes it back to Earth, he is shocked to learn that it is now 700 years in the future and that, and that a similar hierarchy has emerged at home. It was Twilight Zone creator Rod Serling who ultimately decided to make the planet of the apes Earth in the distant future as a twist, and it has become one of the most iconic twist endings in movie history. Our fourth example um, is The Scarlet Letter, written by Nathaniel Hawthorne and first published in 1850. The Scarlet Letter is a classic. It's an exploration of guilt, punishment, and mob mentality in 17th century New England. It's the story about a young woman, Hester Prynne, who is publicly disgraced for committing adultery in giving birth to an illegitimate child, a girl named Pearl. Forced to wear a scarlet A for adultery, Hester slowly redeems herself in the eyes of the Puritan society. Over many years, she challenges the two men in her life, her husband and her lover, with the dark truth of their emotional responsibilities and failures which at the same time, while at the same time, wrestling with her own sinful nature. By the end, the pastor, Arthur Dimsdale, who reveals himself public, publicly to be the father of Pearl and to have had the adulterous affair with Hester, dies of shame. Hester and her daughter Pearl leave the colony for a while, but Hester returns alone years later and eventually dies and is buried near Dimsdale under a tombstone marked with a simple A. In the 1995 film version of The Scarlet Letter, starring Demi Moore, Gary Oldman, and Robert Duvall, there was quite a different story. And it caused quite a stir for the discrepancies it had with the original novel. One website I came across stated that English teachers to this day still wake up screaming in a cold sweat to memories of this famous or infamous adaptation. Why? The filmmakers gave the film the Hollywood treatment, essentially, which meant that no one died and there was a happy ending. In the film, Hester Prynne is about to be hanged, which, by the way, is a scene that is nowhere to be found in the book. But she is saved by her tragic lover, the Reverend Dimsdale. And then Dimsdale and Hester Prynne leave their town together in order to build a life together. A big departure from the original book in its ending, in its themes, and many people say it comes as no surprise that the film adaptation of The Scarlet Letter was universally panned. 
Next up is Forrest Gump. Not many people know that Forrest Gump actually began as a book written by an author named Winston Groom. And again, there are some pretty major differences between Forrest Gump's book, which was published in 1986, and the film version, which premiered in 1994, starring Tom Hanks. Forrest Gump is a story about a slow-witted man with an IQ of about 70, who lives quite an extraordinary life despite his mental and physical challenges. Both the movie and the book showcase his life as a college football star, fighting in Vietnam, captaining a shrimp boat, and they showcase his childlike optimism. As you might recall, the movie version ends with the death of Forrest's beloved Jenny, leaving Forrest to raise their child alone. However, the book wraps up with Forrest starting his own shrimp business in memory of his college friend Bubba, which you may recall Forrest also does in the film. In Winston Groom's book, Jenny survives, but marries another man and has his child. At the time, film director Robert Zemeckis had this to say about the changes. Quote, screenwriter Eric Roth departed substantially from the book. We flipped the two elements of the book, the love story and the adventures, making the love story primary and the fantastic adventures secondary. Also, the book was cynical and colder than the movie. In the movie, Gump is a completely decent character, always true to his word. He has no agenda and no opinion about anything except Jenny, his mother, and God. As with The Firm, the filmmakers went with a more sanitized version of the book. Winston Groom, the author of the Forrest Gump novel, said at the time that the movie, quote, took some of the rough edges off his beloved character. In fact, he was reportedly so unhappy with the film that he apparently started the book's sequel to be called Gump and Company, with Forrest Gump telling readers, don't never let nobody make a movie of your life story. Our sixth example of a film adaptation that changed the ending of the book on which it was based is First Blood. First Blood was the first of Sylvester Stallone's Rambo movies. It was released in 1982 and was based on the novel First Blood by author David Morrell in 1972. Both the book and the movie tell the story of a troubled Vietnam War vet, but the book ends with Rambo's death after a violent showdown with Chief Teasel, who also dies. In the movie, however, Rambo and Teasel, who is played by actor Brian Dennehy, survive, and Rambo turns himself into the authorities. Why the change? Reportedly, early test audiences didn't approve of the book's ending. They wanted to see Rambo live to fight another day, and he did, in a number of sequels. Our seventh example of a film adaptation that changed the ending of the book on which it was based is Breakfast at Tiffany's. Truman Capote's beloved novella that was published in 1958 and then adapted to the big screen in 1961 in a film starring Audrey Hepburn. In the book's ending, Holly Golightly loses her cat and abandons New York for Argentina. It's unclear where this free spirit will end up next. That is very different from the movie which ends with Audrey Hepburn's Holly reuniting with Cat and sharing a passionate kiss with neighbor Paul, played by George Pappard. There's actually no romance between them in Capote's version. Reportedly, Capote wasn't a fan of the movie based on his work, nor of the casting of Audrey Hepburn. Quote, I had lots of offers for that book from practically everyone, Capote reportedly once said in an interview. And I sold it to this group at Paramount because they promised things. They made a list of everything, and they didn't keep a single one. Our eighth book slash movie is A Clockwork Orange. A Clockwork Orange is the story about a teenager named Alex who is living in a dystopian England in the near future. And it depicts his violent exploits and his experiences with state authorities who are intent on reforming him. A Clockwork Orange gives us a bit of a twist because in this case the movie actually has a darker ending than the novel did. 
Usually it's the other way around, and Hollywood goes for that more sanitized ending, as we've seen. In this case, however, Stanley Kubrick, the director, did away with the final chapter of Anthony Burgess's book, which focused on Alex after he is rehabilitated. In the novel, Alex grows out of his murderous tendencies, but in Kubrick's interpretation, Alex remains as psychotic as ever. Kubrick reportedly didn't like the novel's ending. He felt it was too optimistic, given the story's tone and themes. Quote, I think whatever Burgess had to say about the story was said in the book, Kubrick said, but I did invent a few useful narrative ideas and reshape some of the scenes. Reportedly, Burgess, the novelist, was not a fan of the final film product. Quote, the book I am best known for, or only known for, is a novel I am prepared to repudiate. Written a quarter of a century ago, Burgess later recalled, it became known as the raw material for a film which seemed to glorify sex and violence. The film made it easy for readers of the book to misunderstand what it was about, and the misunderstanding will pursue me until I die. Another happy novelist. <laughs> I think we're seeing a trend here. Probably not surprisingly, several Stanley Kubrick film adaptations departed from the source material. Let's take Dr. Strangelove, or How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Bomb, more commonly known as Dr. Strangelove. The movie is a 1964 political satire black comedy film that satirizes the Cold War fears of a nuclear conflict between the USSR and the United States. The film was directed, produced, and co-written by Kubrick and stars Peter Sellers and George C. Scott. The film was actually based on Peter George's 1958 novel, Red Alert, which was originally published in the United Kingdom as Two Hours to Doom, with the author using the pseudonym Peter Bryant. In Red Alert slash Two Hours to Doom, our government, uh, our government leaders managed to narrowly avoid a nuclear catastrophe. Stanley Kubrick, in his version, and perhaps not surprisingly, chose to blow up the world at the end. Although author Peter George received a co-writing credit for the film's screenplay with Kubrick and another writer, it is unclear how much involvement he actually had. He was reportedly dissatisfied with the comedic direction Kubrick applied to the material. Kubrick ends the film with the wheelchair-bound strangelove suddenly standing in the situation room and saying, Mein Fuhrer, I can walk, which is immediately followed by a montage of mushroom clouds accompanied by the melodies of the song, We'll Meet Again. It's quite absurd. What's interesting is that Kubrick originally planned an even more absurd ending. The alternate ending would still end the world, but he wanted to have everyone in the situation room get into a big pie fight. So originally, when Strangelove, de when Strangelove declares that he can walk, General Buck Tor Torgidson, played by George C. Scott, and the Russian ambassador get into an altercation, and the American president, also played by Peter Sellers, gets hit in the face with a custard pie. And next, all the leaders begin throwing custard pies at one another. And then the movie ends, of course, with the inevitable end of the world. Kubrick has been quoted as saying, quote, I decided it was farce and not consistent with the satiric tone of the rest of the film. However, Kubrick's editor, Anthony Harvey, tells a different story in recalling the press screening of the film, which happened to fall on or around November 22, 1963, the day of President John F. Kennedy's assassination. He said, quote, Columbia Pictures was very nervous about anything to show the president, any president in that state, meaning having a pie thrown in his face. That original ending, how it started, that George C. Scott character threw a custard pie to the Russian ambassador, and it missed and hit the president. And then all hell broke loose. And it was like there was about two minutes when after this brilli brilliantly constructed film, it devolves into everybody getting hit by custard pies. And somehow, they were very worried, the studio, about releasing it. They found it might be offensive. So Stanley took it out for the moment, and then the film opened, and he just didn't feel like putting it back in. Our next film adaptation is Invasion of the Body Snatchers. The 1956 black and white classic based on Jack Finney's The Body Snatchers. 
ends with our poor protagonist, Miles, ranting and raving, you're next, as he runs along a busy highway. But no one seems to be heeding his warning of the coming of the pod people. However, in the book, body snatchers actually flee Earth after Miles discovers where their pods are grown and begins to set them on fire. Why the change? The filmmakers opted for a more unsettling ending. However, in an interesting twist, the movie studio wasn't too happy at the time with their choice and reportedly demanded that the director change the movie into a more hopeful outcome. To keep the bosses happy, director Don Siegel and screenwriter Daniel Mainwaring ended up adding in a brief epilogue during which the audience learns that local police had alerted national authorities to the presence of the space invaders so that help would soon be on the way. Reportedly, director Siegel said at the time, quote, the film was nearly ruined by those in charge at Allied Artists who added an ending that I don't like. So unlike our usually unhappy authors, this was a case of an unhappy director. Next up is who framed Roger Rabbit, or should I say, who censored Roger Rabbit, which is the inspiration for whom fra who framed Roger Rabbit. Who censored Roger Rabbit is a surprisingly dark murder mystery. In the novel, Roger hires Detective Eddie Valiant to figure out why Rocco de Grisi, the man who has the cartoon rabbit under contract, hasn't given him his own comic strip. During, during Valiant's investigation, Roger Rabbit is murdered, and his wife Jessica is framed. Valiant spends the rest of the story trying to figure out who killed Roger. The book actually ends with the revelation that a mysterious genie is the culprit. Although there's still a murder at the center of the 1988 movie version, this time Toontown owner Marvin Acme is the victim. Reportedly, Disney and Touchstone Pictures gave the entire story an overhaul when the company bought the film rights from author Gary Wolfe. The studios reportedly hoped to make a family-friendly blockbuster in order to rejuvenate their flagging animation department. Um, and now for our last example of a film adaptation that totally rewrote the book's ending, My Sister's Keeper. Um, I recently wrote a Facebook post that I was doing this presentation and several friends posted that I include this particular movie and book. Um, in the novel, My Sister's Keeper, author Jody Picoult tells the story of a young leukemia patient named Kate for whom her parents conceive another daughter, Anna, in order to have an organ donor. When she turns 13, Anna is asked to donate one of her kidneys to her dying sister. She refuses and sues her parents for medical emancipation. In the book, Anna gets into a terrible car accident and her kidneys are posthumously harvested for Kate, who survives. But for the 2009 adaptation, director Nick Cassavetes chose to reverse the sisters' fates. Kate ends up succumbing to her illness after she refuses to accept her sister's organs. Cassavetes reportedly said, quote, when I read Jody's book, when I got to the ending, that was one of my favorite parts of the book. I loved it. But that being said, I would say that movies are different than books. And when you do a movie, you have to do a lot of research to do a movie because people are asking you questions and you don't know what you're talking about. Going and visi visiting people in the hospital, this story I found repeated over and over, the story we used in the movie. And in reality, none of those stories ended like the book did. Cassavetes also said, quote, I didn't change the book's ending. We changed the movie's ending. And the reason why we did it is I think it's a superior ending for a movie. I find it interesting that he says we changed the movie's ending uh, because as we said, movie making is collaborative. It's not we, it's we, not me. So what do you think oh, um, author Jody Picoult had to say about the change? Hmm, quite a bit actually. She said, authors have no involvement in adaptations. Hollywood thinks we are the least important piece of the puzzle. And by and large, authors have zero control over a film. You give a baby up for adoption, you hope it goes to a good family, and sometimes you're disappointed, which is surely what happened to me with my sister's keeper. She went on to say, in my case, 
The director knew that I thought it was very important that the ending stay the same. And when he met with me, he read the book and said, you're right, that's the only ending for the story. I'm not going to change it. If it does change, I'm going to tell you why and tell you myself. She said, I then spent a year working with him, creating a script that was very close to the book, and then one day a fan who worked at the casting agency contacted me to ask if I knew that they changed the ending. I called Nick, the director, at his house and he wouldn't talk to me. And I flew to the set and he kicked me off the set. And I went to the head of New Line Cinema and I said, you're going to lose money on this film. And he said, we know what we're doing. And sure enough, they lost a lot of money on the film. Another happy novelist. <laughs> um, but you should know, P. Colt wasn't entirely soured on film adaptations. Ellen DeGeneres uh, reportedly has the movie rights to P. Colt's novel, Sing You Home. Um, let's hope the ending to that film adaptation is at least faithful to P. Colt's book. OK, on uh, that note, this presentation has come to a close. I hope you enjoyed examining the endings to some of the film adaptations that have been made from books. Um, I would be happy, if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Massapequa, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, from our resident Monina. Uh, she wanted to know if there was anything in particular that attracted you to this topic. How did you become interested in this? Oh gosh, um, I've always been interested um, in movies. Um, my mom used to, when I lived in Queens, my mom would take me to a Disney double feature every Saturday when I was a little girl, and we would see a cartoon followed by um, a full-length feature. Um, and I always actually envisioned myself as a screenwriter, um, which I, I, I've started quite a few scripts in my day. Um, but I, for some strange reason, when I started off on my journey when I went to high school and college, I thought screenwriting would actually be the the quote, easier uh, endeavor. It's actually quite difficult. Um, as you saw in the example that we showed, there's a lot of attention paid to um, st stage directions and, 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 and then the writing I found very constrained. Um, I, so I actually jumped over to novel writing, um, which is what I do currently, but I, I never forgot my screenwriting um, aspirations and uh, I guess my hope is one day uh, one of my novels will be turned into a screenplay and I will be asked as Gillian Flynn and Emma Donoghue were to pen the screenplay so that's that's the hope but um, but that's where my my love of movies actually came from my my mom um, and my love of reading I guess came from just the idea of you know using books as an escape um, and it was something I, I, I actually started reading thrillers when I uh, was working in the city and I was commuting on the subway back and forth. So I would just devour thrillers by Crichton and Grisham and the examples that we were, that were given. Um, and so I hoped one day that I'd be able to do what they do. And so I feel lucky enough to be doing that. Thank you for your question. Thank you. I think we have, I think we have some questions coming in. Oh, here's the first question. Does the author get to visit the set? during filming? Um, that's an interesting question. Uh, sometimes the author does get to visit the set when, while uh, the movie is filming, but as we saw with Jodi Picoult, sometimes the author isn't even allowed on the set during filming. Um, it's, it's interesting because, like I said, the author really is the star of the show when it comes to the book, um, and it's the director um, who is the star of the show when it comes to the film. So um, the creative decisions are being made by the director. So it kind of makes sense that while the author um, of the novel provided the, the, the foundation for the movie and the foundation for the script, um, as we said before, um, film is such a different medium um, that you know, they sometimes need to take another direction. And as you can imagine, the authors aren't usually very happy with that. But some of them, some of them don't mind. I guess some of them just feel like, like Ernest Hemingway said, you know, you take the money and run. Um, but, but the answer is yes, sometimes the authors do get to visit the sets and other times not. Um, another question, do agents begin selling film rights before the book is published? Again, the answer is yes and no. It, it can happen that way. We saw. Um, earlier, the example with Jurassic Park, 
that Steven Spielberg actually bought the film rights to the novel before it was even published. So yes, so it can happen um, more often than not, I would say, that um, Hollywood, it's sort of a wait and see kind of thing. Hollywood is waiting to see what books do well, especially nowadays with social media. Um, they want to see, they want to, they want to know that they have a sure thing almost. So if a book is a bestseller, it becomes a bestseller, usually that's, I believe, when Hollywood starts to take interest. Any other questions? Um, okay, thank you. Well, thank you for attending today's sem uh, webinar. Um, it was a pleasure to be here and have a, have a wonderful day. Thank you.